take the floor. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm Nico Ramaker. Um, currently, I have a company named uh, Altivo Solutions. Um, I am going to try to share uh, some thoughts with you on uh, on real life experiences of working in China as a as a manager for a, for a big company and also working in China as a manager for a, a, a smaller company. Um, I've started, um, as you kindly uh, pointed out, uh, in my career in, in Alcatel Lucent. So I had the benefits of working in a very large company, which had already a vast experience in working in China, uh, more specifically in, 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 uh, in Shanghai, in Pudong. Um, now, I decided to take up an assignment. And the assignment was very specific also. The assignment was uh, to try to go to China uh, and to set up uh, a new R&D department for a, for a, a new type of the development. Um, these were the early days of uh, the DSL departments, which were uh, which was very successful later on. Um, now, being a, a young manager at that, at that time, uh, in my in my 20s still, um, it was it was difficult. I had no experience going there, so we were going there basically with. Uh, with a few expats, so we were three, four expats, to manage a, a department um, and to try to, to manage it in, in China um, with some local managers. Now, one of the, 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 the big problems that we had to, to start from is, uh, uh, well, first of all, where was China? Uh, for, for my ID, uh, and I'm trying to help you here, it's, uh, it was to the far right, to the far east, very far east. Now. Um, it was my very first time in Asia as well, so it was a whole new experience. Now, the first problem, I think, is that China, it depends how you look at China. Uh, we look at, to China as being in, in the very far east, but China can also be in the very middle. It depends how you look at the world map. And uh, Chinese do not always look at themselves as being uh, part of a country of the far east. They, they tend to, sell, to think about China as being the, the center of the, of the universe, of the, of the world. So already a big uh, difference in, in perception on how, how you go there. Uh, now, obviously, when, when, when you go to, to China, well, first of all, you, you arrive in, in, a, in, a, in a different uh, environment. So I, I, I went to Shanghai, somewhere in the middle uh, of China. But uh, Shanghai is really... Uh, a, a, a metropole. I, we, we call Antwerp a metropole, but there is a tiny difference still. Uh, there is a, uh, we have the Boerentoren, but there they have a few more. Uh. Uh, now, going there, it's a little bit of a shock. You look there, you see the, 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 the skyline of Shanghai, which is huge, massive amount of towers, uh, towers everywhere. Uh, it says more or less if you don't have 30 floors, you hardly get a number in the street. Uh, uh. So this is the, the, the basic on how you go. So going to Shanghai means also you go to a city which is the, the size of, of the province of Antwerp, which is vastly large and, and was very different. Also now we go to a company and uh, then you see people coming from within the city, but within the city means that they come from, from very far away, from hours with uh, with, uh, with buses, with, uh, with uh, metro lines, with whatever means of transportation. So a different way of, of thinking and being in, in, a, in a very different country. Now what is very interesting about Shanghai is basically this, uh, this middle tower. It's called the, the, the Jingmao Tower. Uh, very interesting to go. They have a very nice bar at the top floor. You get a magnificent view, I think you're on floor uh, 89 or 86 or something like that. Nice view. Uh, but what is also very typical for, Chine for China is that being in the Jinmao Tower, which was at that time the, the highest tower in the, in the whole of China, was interesting. But what sometimes is more interesting is to build even a higher, tire, a higher tower next to the Jinmao Tower. So if you go today to, to the Shanghai uh, uh, Pudong area or uh, near the Bund there, uh, you would see that there is the financial tower built with a, with a little hole in, in the top, which is still significantly higher than the, than the Jinmao tower. 
And this shows a, another thing about China is that there is a, a vast competition between the companies, between the people, and people want to, to, to strive forward, want to be the, the best in class, want to be first, want to be better than, than, than their neighbor, which is, uh, in the first instance, you would think about uh, communism as being everybody equal, but China is a very uh, competitive country. Now, all the Chinese feel also they have to go into that competition, that they have to, to follow that race to the top, basically, and they feel also the, the urge to, to do that. They are working very hard, usually, to go into that direction. So the fact that you would have to build a, a new tower even higher perfectly illustrates how the Chinese way of thinking is, on the average, if you have people on your, on your floor. Now, going back to, to, to the Alcatel Lucent story, uh, what did we have to do there? Basically, it was to set up an R&D department of about 150 engineers from scratch, or almost from scratch, uh, which means uh, hiring a lot of people in, in a very short time frame. And basically, we had about one and a half years to, to complete uh, the mission and to have a working R&D department after uh, 18 months. Challenging, challenging. Uh, we went in, we hired a lot of people, and I think after six months, we lost 50% of the people. So we were just talking about uh, turnarounds and turnovers. You can manage, a, well, you can experience a very large turnover. Uh, probably we made some mistakes. Well, for sure we made some mistakes in the beginning by hiring people. It's not easy. Uh, I can remember very well that uh, we get a lot of re reviews and uh, we see the people, well, we select a lot on, on, on language skills, which is very interesting. However, it's an R&D department. It's mainly about being able to, to write software, to build hardware, uh, this kind of thing. So language skills is, is nice, but it's not the core business. So uh, that was already one of the problems. Uh, another problem was that we, we tend to get a lot of junior people. Uh, uh, typically, if you, you, hire, you want to hire a lot of people, you get a lot of junior people in, which is also good because they, they are willing to work, willing to learn. But on the other hand, they are missing a bit of, of the guidance. So we were probably making a lot of mistakes in, in, in uh, neglecting too much the, the middle management layer uh, because the, the team leaders, the small project leaders, they were really not selected well, and we didn't think too much about how to select them. So that was definitely something we, we tried to improve, let's say, in, in, the, in the second round, because we had so much uh, turn, uh, turnover, turnaround of people that we, we, we could basically make three rounds uh, in that time. Um, now in the second round, we tried to pay more attention to people for middle management and less to the people of, on, on the on the floor, let's say, the real engineers, uh, which allows us to, to have, for example, the language skills of the engineers a lot less. Uh, as long as the middle manager can explain it, it, it helps in, in, in working in that way. Now, um, I think if you, if you look over the, the, the whole experience of trying to reach 150, well, I can say that in the end, after 18 months, we actually never succeeded in reaching the 150 goal. Uh, the point was that when people went through a tr kind of training program to get uh, uh, familiar with the products and so forth, we actually l keep on losing in too many people that we cannot fill it in with the training program. Taking into account that you had at that time a training program which took, well, something between two and four months depending on the job they had to do. Uh, it was very hard to get to the 150 people. We weren't close. We were probably at 130, 140, but it was strange that we, we never actually met our, our goal. We, we couldn't really get there. Um, and I think, uh, well, definitely what was said in the earlier presen presentation, there are a lot of problems about payment, uh, uh, salaries, expectations of the people, uh, being young, being in, in what kind of company do they want to be. Uh, 
that's also a big reflection. What kind of company are you? What company do you want to be? And how is your company perceived? Um, many types are possible. You can have a, a whole Chinese company with Chinese management, Chinese everything. Uh, that gives a certain attraction to the people because it gives you sometimes uh, a better understanding and a more clear direction of how things uh, tend to work. You can have the other side of the, of the, the spectrum where you have a, the whole wholly foreign owned company, foreign management, uh, foreign expectations, uh, foreign salaries, which I think still in most cases uh, uh, are a bit higher than, than, than the, the, the pure Chinese uh, salaries. I think definitely if it would, I would be speaking in types of uh, electronic uh, uh, R&D, uh, manufacturing, uh, this kind of uh, uh, areas. Um, but at the same time, for, for a Chinese uh, uh, upcoming engineer, it's difficult because they get a lot of expectations which they cannot meet. They, cannot meet. they, uh, they think about uh, things to do well, but uh, it is sometimes not well appreciated. The, the way on resolving a problem might be different. Um, I remember very well that in, in the very beginning we had a lot of uh, issues by the fact that uh, problem resolving in China went extremely fast. They were like in 20% in, in of the usual time they could nearly solve the problem. The, the problem in that was that the problem was nearly solved and remained nearly solved for a very long time, which was... Uh, for an average uh, uh, global uh, international manager somewhere uh, not in China. Very frustrating because he thinks, oh, we are there and reports uh, to his, uh, his manager already, yeah, done, done next week. Sometimes difficult. Huh? So the, the approach of being there very quickly but not fully there was something which was uh, difficult to change and be a little bit slower but getting there to the, to the exact uh, target which is, uh, which is uh, depicted. Now, um, being in, 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 in China is, uh, is also a, a challenge on your, on your personal life, obviously. Uh, you have to find apartments, uh, the, the, the expensive apartments for, for expats. Now, that all kind of Work, works out if you are in a big company because typically big companies take care of you and, and you, you get uh, your, uh, your uh, contracts uh, well taken care of and you have big HR departments who, uh, who try to take care of things. Uh, so that works well. Now, we also see that when, when times came more challenging uh, it, in the big company that uh, uh, also the attitude changed. We, we came from a, co from a time where... Uh, we were as expats uh, very well treated with a very nice package uh, uh, and this changed over time as, as competition grows and as uh, uh, economics get, uh, get more tensed. Uh, we get to situations where uh, the expats were still wanted but we couldn't really afford them anymore. So we, we changed the attitude in bringing them more to uh, local packages with, with a surplus but with a local contract rather than, the, let's say, a, a Belgian or a French contract with uh, a big expat uh, salary. So uh, this means if today you go for a big company, uh, things have definitely changed in, in most of the companies that you don't go anymore at, uh, as the big uh, expat uh, uh, contract, but you go on a, on a local uh, contract with, uh, with some, some benefits still, but uh, not as many as, as it used to be. So that's a really a change in, in how uh, the attitude is. Now, um, I spent about two years for, for Alcatel and then uh, uh, I, I decided to, to come back and then basically to, to move on to other companies later. Um, and basically at some point in time, I, uh, I worked for a, for a French company uh, called LEA, which is a a small company basically it's a small to medium sized company uh, doing a, a like a 50 million euro uh, business um, but they had the need of getting uh, everything organized also in the, in the far east basically for uh, 
in, in electronics and manufacturing, you, you need to have some manufacturing in China, some R&D in China. Um, is it needed? I think in this kind of sector, probably. Uh, if you have some size, it is needed because of the, the not so much about the salaries, but about the, the ecosystem. I think if you are in, in electronics and electronic manufacturing, the ecosystem is more in, in, in south, southeast uh, China than it is in, in Western Europe. Uh, the reason is that everything is there. The all the companies have the big R&D departments in that region. Uh, all the manufacturing is done in that region, or a large part of the manufacturing is done in that region. But also a large part of the component manufacturing is done in that region, which means that your access to resources is is a multiple of uh, your access of resources which you could have here in, in Western Europe. Uh, and last but not least is that your access to, to, to skilled labor is, uh, is also much higher than your access to skilled labor basically in, the, in Belgium, France, or, uh, or the UK, or whatever. Uh, how many engineers are, are uh, coming out of the university here in Belgium? Well, few. Uh, and basically in electronics and engineering, way too few. Uh, if you see the, the, the graduate schools in China, uh, the engineering schools in China, the, the multiple of people that you get out of there is, is so vast that, uh, that you have a need in, to tap into resources in China most of the time. So uh, we went to, to move another year to, uh, to China, but this time in Shenzhen. Shenzhen is located uh, in the very south of China, uh, just across basically the, the bay from Hong Kong, but on uh, China mainland. Uh, very interesting location because you're very near to Hong Kong, gives you a lot of uh, flexibility in terms of logistics and access to everything, uh, also to, to uh, air hubs and, and this kind of things. Um, but still in China mainland, which makes that uh, you still basically are within all the China mainland uh, uh, activities, also uh, prices and uh, costs, uh, which is important because basically you're looking for a place where you have the ecosystem, where you have a lot of resources, where the prices are moderate. Uh, so there are some choices left. You could go to Hong Kong, which is very easily accessible as a company, but expensive. Mm -hmm. You could go to uh, somewhere near the Tibetan border, um, which is very low in cost, but logistically not so easy. Uh, it is feasible, but uh, it is difficult. Uh, so Shenzhen is a, is a quite good place. So um, this time the mission was uh, set up. Uh, there, there was already some activity there. Uh, we mainly had already some activity for uh, a little R&D department and, and for verification and, and some activity for uh, outsourcing of, uh, of manufacturing. So this time the, the, the question was to, to basically set up a, a, full, a full department, a full, uh, a full subsidiary, uh, which was going to take care of the, the largest part of the R&D, uh, the production, the sales for, uh, for uh, China and, uh, and Asia region. Um, and then basically handling uh, the procurement uh, as well. Um, now again, we were faced with uh, growing the, the, the company from, or growing the team from about 10 people now to, to about 45 was the target. Uh, so this time we tried to, to take it a little bit uh, more intelligent as uh, we hope to have some, some lessons learned from a uh, previous time. Uh, well, Again, difficult, because how, how to get to, uh, to, to resources. So one of the first things we, we did was basically to hire uh, an HR person. Now, the HR uh, lady uh, in her 20s, uh, very familiar, uh, um, was indeed uh, a good HR lady because she could calculate salaries and so forth uh, very well, and she was uh, very communicative uh, as well. Um, but she had basically no HR experience. 
she could not tell me whether the guy was a good engineer or not. Which is my basic question, because if I hire a guy, is he an engineer, is he a good engineer? That's what I want to know. Okay, the salary we can discuss later, but the basic question is, is he a good engineer or is he a good logistical person or is he a good sales guy? She had no clue, huh? no idea. If I say, is he good, he say, she said yes. If I say, is he not good? She said, do you think he's not good? No, no, well then I think he's not good, no, no. So whatever I said was true, <coughs> that, so that was easy at least. Um, so hiring the HR was, was needed in the sense of dealing through all the administrative uh, things, but was not helping in getting the right people on, on board. So uh, we, we put uh, uh, advertisements out to attract people. We, put, uh, we go to, uh, to uh, headhunting firms. I can remember very well the, the first report I get from the headhunting firms, like 20 20 uh, CVs of people, and um, well, typically you try to scan through them first, so I read the first 10 lines and I read uh, the last five, uh, and I hope that the middle is, uh, is okay afterwards. Um, so I scan through them, and the first one, I read the first 10, the last five, and his hobby is, uh, I like to watch television. <laughs> Throw it away. Uh, the next one, I, I look at it, his hobbies, uh, I like to watch talk shows. <laughs> Throw it away. So I think in, in about 10 minutes I read all the CVs, uh, but I had zero left because they kind of, except one I think, was not mentioning television because he forgot <laughs> it, I think. Uh, so um, it's already something very different than uh, your typical CV you would get in Belgium because uh, if you are a Belgian engineer and you write on your CV in big capital letters, yes, I like to, work, to watch uh, talk shows on TV. I'm not sure it's so well appreciated. Uh, I think you're not uh, going to be uh, on the top of the pile by default. Uh, so okay, I went back to the, to the top of the pile to, re to read them again and try to, to, to forget about uh, the watching TV part. Um, again, difficult language. Do I want a good English speaking engineer? Do I want a good engineer? <laughs> Different. Uh, Preferably both, but uh, hard to find. Uh, do I want uh, a good sales guy? Does he have experience? Does he have this? Does he have that? Uh, big CVs. Um, but typically what you have as a resource pool is a lot of young people. A lot of young people. A lot of them talented, I think. But young and not so experienced. So that makes it difficult if you want to start up a department, a company, is to, to hire your average pool, which makes that uh, you can have, fine, you can have 50% of young people, but you need some experience in, in your company as well. Uh, especially as the goal was to, to, to leave after one year and to, to retain a certain uh, independence and uh, uh, own Chinese management. So, yeah. We, we try to go to, to many, many CVs. Uh, we invite some of the people. Um, typically, um, after, let's say, a few months, we had some people hired. And typically what we had uh, is that we let the, the engineers themselves scan uh, the CVs as well. At least one engineer scanned the CVs and talked to the talk to the, the candidates uh, before I did. Um, and this was trying to get at least the good from the bad engineers out. Uh, because then we, we made some kind of questionnaires, some question lists on how to, to deal with it. <coughs> now, regardless of getting good people or not good people, I, I knew I was going to be faced with uh, a, a certain turnover. Now, in the end, we were able to manage it pretty low. I think we were at... A, then a good 10%, which was, a, I think, a, a good success. Um, but um, still, for the, to manage the turnover is what we did with the, with the development team in, in France. So this time, the development team was in France. Uh, was to, to spend quite some effort in, um, in structuring things. Because from my Alcatel experience with the, with the very large turnover, I had learned that 
it's possible as an organization to, to work around that. Uh, in a sense, to, to structure your, your, uh, your, uh, your tasks much more, to detail them out, and to, to put much more emphasis on the process. Uh, now, if you can do that to, to a very large extent, somewhere you can, you can diminish the, the, or you can make that the, the role of the engineer becomes less important in the whole process because your, the tasks are more described, the processes are more described, and it helps to, to get a, young, a lot of young people into a certain way of thinking. Now, going back to a small, medium-sized company, they don't have the experience in doing that. So that, that's a bit of a clash of culture because on the one hand, you want to go to China, you will be faced with a big turnover turn of people, and on the other hand, you have to have processes, which is not really uh, the dada of, uh, of many uh, small and medium-sized companies. So this is a challenge to manage because on the one hand, you need to manage your, your, your French uh, uh, overall uh, CEO saying, I want to cut uh, resources in France because in the end, okay, uh, some resources had to be cut in France. But on the one hand, I also needed to retain them for a while, at least to make some processes clear and not to be just stuck in the head of, a, of, a, of somebody in, in, a, in a French lab, uh, lab somewhere. So this is a very difficult path to, to walk and, and the path is very narrow because you need to hire the people, you need to hire uh, the skills, you need to, to get to a certain structure, you need to face the challenges of, of, of change, um, but you also need to, to manage your, uh, your global, uh, uh, your international managers that uh, have different expectations because they want to go fast, they want to go uh, cheap, and uh, going cheap is not always the, the very best way. You need to find some, some way uh, in between. Now, um, going through all this, I think you are able to, to go, even as a small and medium-sized company, to go very quickly with a good running R&D department, sales department, operational department in China uh, in, in, a, in a time space of, of about one year. So we, we, we tried to set it up, and I think after one year we were, we were successful. It doesn't mean we didn't have any problems left after one year. But on the average, uh, as a company, you could, uh, you could very well run uh, your business from a big, uh, a big China operations, let's say. Now, um, being in, in, in China, we, um, we also had to deal uh, definitely the second time with a lot of uh, manufacturing. Uh, so manufacturing in, in China is, uh, is, is different than what you see basically as manufacturing in, in Europe, in Europe, you see very, very strict uh, companies, buildings, uh, very uh, ergo ergonomic uh, buildings, uh, optimized on processes. Typically, China factory buildings. Uh, I just put an example. It's it's just a, it's a box uh, with some floors, and that's it. And they try to manage their their uh, their, um, their business in it. Uh, this is difficult um, because. You also need to adapt towards uh, the Chinese uh, business, uh, the Chinese way of working in a, in a factory. So being in factories, it's, um, it's, uh, it's different than, than from uh, what you see in Belgium. Uh, so typical view of, of a factory in, in, in Shenzhen or uh, Guangdong or Pearl River Delta area uh, is a, a lot of girls uh, sitting in a row. By the way, I know you for sure know why there are always girls in sitting in the room, and not boys. No, no. Yeah, but the girls are also, I, I hate to admit it, but 10% faster than the boys. Eh? So, uh, so for precision work with fine hands, uh, girls are a lot faster than boys. And apparently they can focus better as well. But. Important is you go to a factory. We talk about living as an expat uh, in high fancy uh, apartments, very expensive. Uh, if you have a factory, it's a little bit different because you're blue colored uh, workers. They live in a, in a dormitory next to the factory, always. Uh, 
This is a part of their, uh, their salary. The salary is not so large, but they get uh, uh, lodging and, and food, basically. But lodging is, is kind of uh, this kind of thing, where you're, uh, you're uh, four, six, eight, twelve people in, in a small room, basically in shifts for, for sleeping. Uh, it's not a, a luxury position. Uh, also, a little word about the, the, the Chinese manager, because at some point in time, you need to make often a transition between an expat manager and a Chinese manager. Now, typically, how do we work as an expat manager is uh, more or less the, the consensus model. Uh, I'm going to try to talk to, to all of you, trying to convince you that we have uh, the good way forward. And if uh, everybody is convinced, OK, then the team can go. That's not always the Chinese way of working. The Chinese way of working is very often that you have the manager, he has his vision, and he says, this is the direction. And this is not challenged. It's also not very appreciated by the Chinese manager that it is challenged. Uh, what typically would happen here, I think there is no harm here in a, in a European organization to challenge your, your boss and saying, okay, are we doing the right thing? Yeah, are you sure? And if they're both convinced, yeah, let's go. Uh, in China, no. If the boss says it's white, then it is white. Uh, whatever you want to do, it will remain white, and nobody in the organization will challenge that. It's something to keep in mind also if you're talking to middle managers of other companies. Uh, you don't want to convince them to go against their management because in the end they don't want to do that and it will not work anyway. So it's something, if you want to have a significant change, you must be sure to talk to a person which is high enough in the organization who can implement the change. If you go too low in the organization, it can't work. It's something to to keep in mind. Now, what is the dream of all Chinese uh, uh, employees? Typically, if you talk about uh, office employees like R&D people or manage, uh, managers or salespeople, is well, it's to, to have their own apartment. Uh, there is a Pudong is full of blocks. Uh, Shenzhen is uh, building blocks uh, like this uh, on an hourly rate, I think. Uh, it, it goes extremely fast in terms of pro property development, so the big dream of everybody is to buy the apartment. Also to buy the car. Uh, the, the brand is called BYD. BYD is, um, stands for Build Your Dream. So I think it's a very good name for a brand. Bring for your dollars. <laughs> bring your dollars can be as well. Uh, you can build... You can bring your RMB, but if you need to pay in cash, it's a big pile. Um, but BYD is, a, I think, is a very successful Chinese company, but also represents a bit China in, in the sense that it's really the dream of every Chinese employee to, to go and live in a big city, to have the apartment, to drive the car. And this is a dream which is accessible. I mean, if I looked at uh, the people I worked with, uh, let's say, two years ago in, in China, 60% have their apartment and about 30-40% have their own car. And in fact, they prefer not BYD, but typically European car. If you go to China, what is also very important is that uh, you learn to, to eat uh, well, Chinese. Uh, it means you need to use the chopsticks. Try it at home before you go. It's, it's always handy. Uh, especially after a jet lag, trying to, to eat peanuts with your chopsticks, it's not so easy. Uh, uh, Chinese dishes are always very, very different than, than European dishes. Uh, a lot of dishes in the center of the table. You don't want to uh, have your own dish, uh, so uh, be aware that uh, it is like... But more important is that a lot of business things uh, basically get concluded on the, on the dinner table. Uh, I think in, in many of my business, the, this discussions I had, the final decision often went on, on, uh, on the dinner table. Together with uh, the boss of the other company, you go, you have a dinner, and basically there you agree or you don't agree. Later on you fill in the details, but the contract is less of value than the agreement you had at the business dinner. And what is also important is to treat your employees well. This means that uh, at least once a year at Chinese New Year, you go to this huge restaurant, I mean huge, like a thousand or 1,500 places, and you have your, uh, your business, uh, your, your, 
end of year dinner, uh, where you have a, a nice dinner with all of your employees. Very important to treat them in a correct way. So don't forget about that. And if you don't know what to do on a Sunday afternoon, well, you can always go with your friends and uh, play some mahjong. So that was my presentation. Uh, I hope you, you enjoyed it. And uh, if you have some questions, by all means, uh, be my guest. <laughs>